Hello, and welcome back to the Masonic Roundtable, a weekly hangout where Masons from around the world get together to talk about Masonic news and opinions in a friendly and social manner. The thoughts and opinions expressed here are solely the opinions of the participants and do not represent any Grand Lodge statements or positions. Make sure you keep your conversations open for the public and on the level. To interact with us, send questions and comments to our Twitter page, at Mason Roundtable, or on the Facebook event page. Uh, as usual, my name is John Ruark. I'm a past master of the Patriot Lodge, number 1957. And since this is a Royal Arch episode, I will also say that I'm a proud member of Loudon, chapter 55, in uh, Virginia. And I will hand it off to Nick to do his introduction. Alrighty. Uh, well, Nick Johnson, past master of Corinthian Lodge, number 67 in Big Time Farmington. Also a past high priest times two for Corinthian chapter number 33, Royal Arch Masons, also in Big Time Farmington. Alright. Thank you, Nick. Juan Sepulveda. Make Good sure evening, everybody. <laughs> Juan Sepulveda here from Orange Blossom Lodge number 80, and I'm a proud member of Eureka chapter number 7, Royal Arch Masons in Orlando, Florida. And the host of the Winding Stairs Freemasonry Podcast. Branding. Yes. <laughs> Jason. Hey everybody, thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Jason Richards and I am the Junior Warden of Acacia Lodge number 16 in good old Clifton, Virginia, as well as a member of the Patriot Lodge number 1957 in Fairfax, Virginia, and a companion in Fakir Chapter Royal Arch number 25 in Virginia. All right, and our special guest tonight, the very most excellent... Donald McAndrews, why don't you list your Masonic resume? <laughs> There's not that, enough time that, on the show. Yeah, that would blow, that'd blow the whole evening. Good night, everybody. <laughs> as far as Royal Ash chapters go, I'm a member of uh, uh, Warren chapter number five in Warrenton, uh, Fauquier chapter number 25 in Fairfax, um, Manass uh, Loudon chapter number 55 in Herndon, uh, Manassas chapter 81. Uh, in Manassas, uh, our new chapter in Ashburn, uh, uh, Potomac chapter 88, uh, Man Page chapter number 89, and the uh, Royal Arch chapter of research, uh, 1753. So a whole bunch of chapters. Right, and you have the distinct title, as <laughs> we said, of being most excellent. And we'll probably get into a little bit of that tonight, uh, but it's, it's an honor to have you here. Um, it's a pleasure. Yeah, I always love to talk about Royal Arts. It's uh, <laughs> it's my favorite thing. Uh, uh, a lot of people think of uh, the York Rite degrees, and particularly the Royal Arts, as being something different. But uh, that's that's the most important thing I have to say for the evening is that it's not something different. Uh, Royal Arch has intimately to do with the first three degrees in Masonry, and it's my contention that any Mason who uh, would like to seek more light in masonry, uh, one of the best places to get started is the Royal Arch Degrees because of their intimate relationship with the first three degrees. They, they give you a lot more information, they expand on those degrees, uh, it's just uh, an excellent way to learn more. Uh, in our first three degrees, uh, after each obligation, uh, we're asked the question, what do you most desire? And the answer is light, further light or more light and uh, to me this is just the natural uh, path to go once you've finished your first three degrees. If you want to know more about those degrees, uh, the Royal Arch is the place to go because it'll really give you a lot more illumination. Awesome. So as we uh, addressed in episode 56, uh, we did a York Rite 101 which covered <clears throat> the, the bodies of, you know, the um, the Royal Arch degrees, the cryptic degree system, and the Knights Templar system. Um, if you're not familiar with the York Rite degrees in general, that's probably a good one to go back to. Uh, but I wanted to bring uh, most excellent Don on to give us a little bit more insight as to what what Royal Arch Masonry has to do. Why did you know, specifically why did you choose that path to to kind of go climb that that Masonic ladder, at least in the leadership role? Well, that's that's an interesting question, and uh, I'm sure, like many, uh, my motivation was not uh, 
out of any knowledge of what I was really getting into. Uh, I had friends who were encouraging me to join and did it pretty blindly. Uh, also, I have to say that uh, when I joined Royal Arch, I took my degrees in a festival. Uh, and that, in my opinion, is absolutely the worst way. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So is that like a one-day class? That's a one-day, and oh. uh, uh, you take all the degrees at once, and you walk away having no idea what just happened. <laughs> That's really funny because agree. Uh, we, uh, uh, our last episode was on one-day conferrals uh, yeah. with uh, the past master, so if you can do a, a one-day blue lightning, you can be a past master. And if you do a one-day... Uh, system of Royal Arch, you too can be the most excellent. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's it's a bad way to do it. It really is. And uh, if you have a little bit of time between the degrees to reflect and think about and maybe ask a few questions, uh, those degrees are much more meaningful to you. And, and uh, I can say that from personal experience because uh, that's the way I took it. Uh, in our district here, uh, District 17 in Virginia, uh, we're very fortunate to have a lot of people who know the work. Uh, the work is done very well, uh, and it's always done uh, one degree at a time so that the uh, candidate going through the process has a chance to really fully experience it. Uh, also, you don't have a huge number of guys where most everybody is sitting on the sideline and one exemplar actually gets to experience it. So uh, it, that's the best way to do it. Uh, uh, there are some times when, out of necessity, you have to do a, a group full. I just uh, issued a dispensation for a chapter down in Petersburg. Uh, they've got seven candidates for the Mark Master degree, and they wanted permission to open early and get started early, which I freely gave. I'm all in favor of that. Well, they also needed to uh, do a little business because I think they were actually going to vote on some petitions uh, <laughs> upon whom they would then confer the degree. But uh, 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 that that's a good reason to do that. But uh, it's best to take the degrees uh, one at a time and, and not jam everybody together. Okay, so well, can I you... Go ahead, sorry. Nick. Uh, well, you know, I was thinking about, you know, and, and exactly I, I was kind of pushed into, I, I took the mark and the past master as uh, two separate degrees, but then I was kind of forced into a, a, to finish it all up at a one day, and, you know, it's one of those that you're absolutely correct. I mean, it felt like everything was just kind of shoved right into one ear, and then most of it fell out the other, and it took a while to pick all those pieces back up and, you know, put it back in back in my head, and, you know, for me, though, it's, it's the, the one advantage that... The, the York Rite in general and the chapter in particular has is that it, it has a personal intention that you cannot get in just about any other Masonic body. I mean, that you know, Shrine, Scottish Rite, all of them. You don't get that same personal touch that you can. That is a huge potential and its greatest strength. And I think it's kind of sad that so many so many chapters rely on festivals to fill up fill up their roles. So. Now, can you now, talk brother, about the extension of the degree system, how Royal Arts ties into um, the Blue Lodge as an Oh, absolutely. Body? Yeah, that, that's, uh, that, that's, that's the heart of it, really. Uh, because when you uh, look at the first degree we confer, the Mark Master degree, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty ancient degree. And over in England, it's a separate system of masonry. They have a Grand Lodge of Mark Master Masons. Uh, their Grand Lodge Hall is on St. James's Street, just literally a stone's throw from St. James's Palace. Uh, it's, it's an incredible degree that's a, an extension of the fellow craft degree. It's, it's just jam-packed full of craft stuff. And uh, you, you hear in the first three degrees, on every opening and closing, the uh, senior warden says that his duties are to pay the craft their wages, if any be due. But do you know where wages are paid? Do you know I, when wages are paid? I never got you know? paid at Lodge. I usually pay my dues. Yeah. So. <laughs> Do you know how much the wages are? Do you know what process they use to actually pay them? Do you know how they could uh, protect themselves from paying wages to somebody who wasn't due wages? And do you know what the penalty was for trying to collect wages you weren't due? Uh, all of this is part of the very first section of the Mark Master degree, which is a very, very fascinating degree. Uh, in Scotland, originally the Mark Master degree was conferred on fellow crafts after they had taken that degree, but before they took the Master Mason degree. Hmm. 
Uh, once the conversion to speculative masonry took place, uh, they had to sign an agreement that uh, they would only confer that degree on on master masons. But uh, uh, the ancient usage or an original usage was to confer that degree after the fellow craft degree because it extends so much more information about the fellow craft degree. The second degree we confer is the uh, um, past master degree. And in Virginia, and I think in some other jurisdictions, but particularly in Virginia, you are not eligible to be elected Sen uh, a warden, senior or junior warden of your lodge unless you've had that degree. The lessons are so important that they feel you need to have that information before you're uh, in a position to preside. Uh, and, a, and there's a grip and word of a past master which I, there was a guy visiting from Bolivia and uh, he uh, sat in on our past master degree and said it was exactly what uh, they had. I mean, maybe a little different in form, but the, certainly the same grip and the same uh, word was communicated. So uh, that that's interesting to see the universality of that. Uh, the uh, third of the degrees in the Royal Arts system is the most excellent master degree, which has to do with the uh, completion and dedication of the temple. And it, it's a beautiful ceremony. It, the ceremony is taken right out of the Bible, uh, but also it addresses uh, some really interesting questions such as uh, uh, what uh, what happened at the end of the building. Uh, you have uh, 153,300 uh, workers. What happened to them? Where did they go? What, what was the deal? Uh, and how did they maintain the temple after it was uh, finished? Uh, there would have been ne necessity to keep uh, people on hand to actually maintain the temple. So uh, all of those things are addressed in the most excellent master degree, which is a beautiful degree. And then the Royal Arch degree, it, it jumps forward into hi history uh, a good 500 years. The temple is destroyed. Jerusalem is destroyed. The Jews are hauled off into captivity. And after 50-some years in captivity, the Persians come and take over Babylon. And Cyrus, king of Persia, attributes his victory to the Jewish God and is so grateful that he not only frees the Jews, but he gives them money to go back and rebuild the temple. And while they're rebuilding the temple, they discover certain things that we were told in the second section of the Master Mason's degree were lost, including a lost word. Whoa. Uh, and those are discovered as as the construction is done. And so the, the lost the true lost word is actually restored in the Royal Arch degree. So the Royal Arch degree originally was not considered to be a separate degree or something different. It was considered to be the last half of the Master Mason degree that you weren't worthy to receive until you had actually presided as master of your lodge. So that's a good point. We brought up, we talked about Scottish Rite Masonry, specifically Scottish Rite craft degrees in a previous episode, and how if someone from a York Rite system, York Rite Blue Lodge, joins um, a Scottish Rite body, they start on the fourth degree, and the story is a little different. But um, that validates, again, the point that you're trying to make, that in a York Rite Blue Lodge system, the, the Royal Arch degree system is the continuation of that, that storyline and, yeah. and has a, a much better story arc that, that carries on the lessons that you've learned. Well, now, Juan, Juan, you had a question, too? Yeah, and that that adds to to the premise of the question. Um, Don mentioned that doing it in a festival, it's like drinking from a fire hose. You have these <laughs> brothers that come in on a Saturday morning, and they're going you know all the way through the night, and it's a lot to take in. And these are profound degrees. There are beautiful ceremonies, beautiful lessons contained therein. Uh, but the fact that they're all mixed in the timeline, it's not a just a single timeline. Um, having it not as a festival, have, but having it as individual degrees through the months would be easier to, to digest. But my question is, from someone like you who went through a festival uh, like that, and like me, what advice would you have for someone like me who actually went through a Saturday and a Sunday of, you know, 
of a blast of information. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, that's a good question. And, and if you're looking to go into Royal Arch, I think I would try to seek out uh, a chapter that is capable of doing the degrees. Um, it may or may not be one that's available nearby, which is a shame if it's not, but uh, uh, certainly you have a choice about which chapter you would join, and uh, that might be a good question to ask is whether or not they uh, actually do the work in their chapter. Uh, and But for those of you who have already had the degrees and had the same experience that I originally had, uh, you know, it's not too late to appreciate and enjoy the degrees uh, if you learn the work and uh, help confer the work. And that's something, you know, you can bitch about uh, the fact that uh, it ain't being done right, but uh, you roll your sleeves up and learn the parts, and uh, you can help uh, solve the problem. So uh, uh, that, that is a, a solution. Now, here in Virginia, I'd like to mention Virginia and West Virginia are a little different than the rest of the world, uh, really. Uh, in Virginia, we have the cryptic council degrees, uh, and we do them right in the middle of the four Royal Arch degrees. Uh, this stems back to the 1840s uh, there, when there was a grand cryptic council in uh, uh, Virginia, but for whatever reason, it was during the uh, uh, anti-Masonic era, and I think they that may have had a part to play in why they decided to basically close shop. They closed down the Grand Council, but they came to the Grand Royal Arch Chapter and petitioned the Grand Royal Arch Chapter to perpetuate the cryptic degrees. So Virginia, and of course in the 1840s, there was no West Virginia, it was all Virginia. Uh, so uh, Virginia took over the cryptic degrees, but on one condition, and that's an interesting story. Uh, their condition was that the uh, degrees would be conferred uh, in chronological order, and we are the only ones to do that. We confer the select master degree followed by the royal master degree. Everybody else in the world mm -hmm. confers the royal master degree first, the select master considered to be the higher degree in which all the business of the cryptic council is conducted. Uh, now, I belong to a cryptic council in uh, District of Columbia. In fact, I'm the deputy grand master of the grand council in uh, District of Columbia right now. and. Uh, uh, it's interesting to see the differences, but the similarities. And the work really is, for all intents and purposes, the same. Uh, so in Virginia, we we do them in the middle uh, because if you think of the dedication of the temple being after uh, the death of one of our Grand Masters, uh, it's only fitting that the uh, select master degree, which was a secret work going on underneath the temple while it was being built, uh, was obviously prior to that time. And the royal degree is the night before the death of, of uh, Hiram Abiff. So that uh, it makes it chronological. We do the select and then the royal. And then, of course, after his death, we do the most excellent master degree. Well, and I really wish that we would do that, that uh, in most councils because it's true. I mean... The, you know, I mean, in, in Commandery for the longest time, and I've seen a, a patent that a Sir Knight was given, and, you know, it used to be the Order of Malta would come last, and the Order of the Temple was in the middle the middle order, and they finally swapped them because they saw that, well, the Order of the Temple is the better story, so you probably should end with that one. And, you know, I've seen the <laughs> Leave them on a good note. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like, you know, I don't know. But uh, you know, and that's the thing is, I always, I, I really wished that the royal, uh, royal master was the last degree because the monologue in that, that particular degree, I mean, it's chilling, and it's, yes, it it's is. just perfect. Now, Don, um, another question I had for you was, um, with your your title of uh, most excellent, uh, doing the administrative things for the state of Virginia, what? Uh, can you tell me any uh, fun stories so far? You were about a third of the way through your year, right? And uh, what what kind of additional duties does that hold, and what do you have to do as far as? Uh, well, I'm, I'm up to uh, I'm up to twenty dispensations already for the year, so uh, uh, I'm sure there'll be many more to come. But uh, and I, I actually may get some flack from some of the past uh, grands over that. But uh, you basically deal with it as it comes, and uh, uh, we actually had a request for. Uh, 
uh, not only uh, opening early to do degree work, but also to uh, do a particular degree festival style, uh, which means they wanted to be able to sit the candidates on the sidelines and use one exemplar. And so my question was, what do you have, 15 candidates? The answer came back, no, we only have seven. I said, well, not only no, but hell no. <laughs> <laughs> with, with, seven, okay. with seven, you can darn well give everybody the full experience there. Good, and there's good no for reason you. That's to, awesome. To skip over. So uh, uh, you can open early, but you can't uh, do festival style. So that, that's, that's you're cheating the candidate because you're lazy, basically. <laughs> and that's, that's not a good excuse in my books. So. so for those uh, watching who don't know what a dispensation is, that's uh, basically when you need permission to bend the rules, and so it has to go up to the highest level uh, of, of your body and then uh, make sure that it's approved to a to temporarily yeah. bend the rules for whatever circumstance. Now, Jason, I'm, I'm the only one that can violate your bylaws. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just going to make the the comment that that's one of the reasons why I jumped into Royal Arch so quickly after becoming raised was I knew that you got you got to go through each degree, and it was very much the uh, an idea of personal attention. Vice saying, you know, attending a Scottish Rite reunion or going directly into the shrine. And uh, I just I can't overstate that enough. That and there's a difference between watching a de degree take place and actually living the degree and going through it. There's another aspect too about doing degree work. Uh, and here I'll get a plug in for one of my uh, favorite topics, and that is uh, by learning the work. If you if you memorize the work, if you learn the work. Uh, there's a real value to you of doing that because once you get a certain amount of this knowledge in your head, it's sort of like a database. And when you read something, when you hear something, when you see something, suddenly you connect two dots and now you understand things. It's not a matter of just knowledge, but it's a matter of understanding. And that takes you to a whole new level. I had an experience when I was over in Israel uh, we went to uh, the uh, Qumran, uh, where the Essenes had their, uh, well, the Dead Sea Scrolls and all that stuff. I got a book over there on the Essenes. We didn't have that much time to talk to anybody about the Essenes. So I got a really good book on the Essenes. And this was an eye-opener for me because they talked about the Essenes being Zedekites, the followers of Zadok. Well, if you know your Bible, and believe me, it's not that I'm a biblical scholar, but I had to learn a part in the uh, uh, Thrice Illustrious Master degree, which is a cryptic chair degree. Uh, and it's the story of uh, David uh, on his deathbed uh, and how Solomon came to be uh, anointed king of Israel. Well, Solomon was anointed by Zadok, the priest. So guess who became the first high priest of the Temple of Solomon, Zeta, obviously. And the tradition for the Jews from that time forward was that not only did you have to be a Levite, uh, a priest, to be high priest, you had to be a direct descendant of Zadok. Well, in the time of Jesus, and even before that, uh, with the Roman occupation, the high priesthood actually became something that was auctioned or sold. And you not only didn't have to be a descendant of Zadok, you didn't even have to be a Levite. You could buy the high priesthood. Uh, so it, it was a position being sold. Well, the purists, uh, the Essenes were certainly the purists, uh, they said this is wrong. And they wanted to see a return to the practice of only a descendant of Zadok could be high priest. Well, this is like uh, you're bucking the system there, uh, and they could charge for this, so you're threatening the whole livelihood of all these people, so their lives were at risk. And that's why they were out in the desert at Qumran, because <laughs> they weren't safe being there in Jerusalem, and they were out there studying and praying and hoping for the Messiah to come and kick butt uh, <laughs> so that they could restore the uh, priesthood of Zadok. Uh, so I would never have understood that, if I didn't know that Zadok was the first high priest. And I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't learned the Thrice Illustrious Master degree. So there you go. Having those little connections, suddenly you see something and you really understand the history of it. And that, that to me is just priceless. 
you know, I'll build on that and say that, you know, as a, as a Christian, you know, it's good to read your Bible and make sure that you eventually start to memorize Bible verses so you have some context, so you have something that you can, you can pull back when you have, uh, you know, a certain need to, to pull that back back up. Now, also, that applies to your Blue Lodge as well, right? That if you get involved, if you learn your ritual, especially if you're trying to get into a chair, um, it makes Masonic education that much easier because you're not struggling over the ritual word. Now that you've got the ritual memorized, now you can start to peel back and understand the meaning behind it. And, and as you said, Don, I love the way you put it, you'll start to connect the dots in both the ritual as well as other influences. Well, that, I think that becomes the difference between simple knowledge and true understanding. Uh, there's a big distinction there, and you can accumulate a lot of knowledge, you can memorize a lot of stuff, but until you start connecting the dots, you don't really have a, a true understanding of what the significance of all this is. So. And I'll go a step further. I think the practical application of that, once mastered, becomes wisdom. Yes, exactly. Yeah, Sophia. So, okay, you other so guys one, chime in here. <laughs> you, you're well, I was gonna, I was gonna <laughs> ask you for a little bit of context on um, one of the one of the um, quotes uh, of masonry or about masonry that we hear about a lot is a quote by Mackey to say, you know, the original Masonic degrees are are three, you know, the Entered Apprentice, Fellowcraft, and Master Mason, to include the Holy Royal Arch. And I was wondering if you had any more context on why Mackey wrote it that way and what was going on at the time. Actually, that was long before Mackey. That goes back to uh, uh, Anderson and the Anderson Constitutions. Uh, that, that is the foundation and the very beginning of speculative masonry, which is quite different from operative masonry. Um, it certainly out grew, grew out of operative masonry, but uh, uh, that's the basic. And, and in our ancient constitutions, uh, uh, the reason that is uh, worded that way is that originally the Royal Arch degree was not considered a separate degree. It was uh, held back from the new master masons, uh, and they were not considered worthy to have that high level of information until they had actually served as master of their lodge. So that became a chair degree, basically. And the Royal Arch degree in the early days, back in the 1700s, was always conferred in the Blue Lodge. There was not a separate organization. It wasn't until uh, uh, later on that the, uh, uh, the Royal Arch degree became part of a separate system. So what's the time frame uh, thereabouts? Did it kind of split off into its own organization? Well, from 1717, of course, uh, keep in mind, in 1717, when the speculatives actually began uh, formally, there were only two degrees. You had the EA and the uh, Fallacraft. Fallacraft. Yeah, that, those were the only two degrees. And uh, a bit later on, I'm not sure how many years, actually, but probably just a handful of years, uh, they invented the Master Mason degree. Uh, I think it was somewhere around 1730s. Yeah, that, that probably makes sense. Yeah. Uh, the Master Mason degree is actually derived from the operatives' uh, uh, annual assemblage. Uh, they would have a grand assemblage every year, uh, still do in, in London, uh, and at the grand assemblage, now the operatives are ruled over by three Grand Master Masons which makes sense going back to the history of the building of the temple. Uh, and at the Grand Assemblage, the third Grand Master Mason, the one of the, the uh, lowest rank, uh, the third Grand Master Mason portrays himself in the ancient drama, and he is slain, and then we have to elect a new Grand Master Mason. Hmm. Uh, that, and even the indentured apprentices, as we call them in the operatives, the indentured apprentices are welcome to come and observe the ancient drama. So the legend of Hiram Abiff was not restricted to just uh, the higher ranking. It was it was for everybody and it was performed once a year and commemorated that. It is that ancient drama that was basically rewritten into the Master Mason degree. So uh, and, and it makes a very neat tidy three degree system 
uh, so it, it's a, a piece of beauty. But when you see the operative system, you you really see where that came from, and uh, it uh, it's uh, definitely different. <laughs> Well, and, and you know, it's kind of interesting. Is like if you look at something like the Graham manuscript that then has has a Noahide uh, focus, you know, so it's the oh, Noah yeah. story and the flood. Right, right. And so you know, you've got two competing stories, and then I've also heard a theory, and I'm not sure who who it was, but then the third theory that that Zerubbabel was number was number three, and you know, it was these three competing stories, and ultimately. <clears throat> the legend that we have now is the one that won out, and then the rest of them just kind of fell into place in other places. Well, the interesting thing about the Noachites, uh, if if you stop and think about it, uh, the Royal Arch Grand Omnific Word, which is given to us in that degree, the, the original word, in the lecture is explained that it was uh, the word originally communica communicated by God to Enoch. Enoch was the great grandfather of Noah. Yep. So, from a Noahite standpoint, if you've ever wondered why Enoch and Noah are woven into our Masonic history, uh, there is a direct connection, and that is the word, uh, the name of God, communicated by God Himself to Enoch. Well. <laughs> There's a lot well, of questions answered right here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew you wouldn't disappoint. That's great. My head has exploded so many times this episode already. That's I didn't hear much of a bang. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're muted. There's not much inside, as our listeners can attest. Juan, uh, you got any other questions? Well, he, he just went over all, the, all of the questions I had right there. Hey, you know, Don, the, the one you should uh, oh, go ahead, Juan. No, that he 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 went briefly over um, something that I did have a question regarding, and the first mention of the Royal Arch, which we had discussed previously, was very um, nebulous. It was just a a brief mention, and I have here that it's in the. Faulkner, Faulkner's uh, Dublin Journal in January of 1743, and it mentioned that there was there was a St. John's Day parade with the where there was the Royal Arch carried by two excellent Masons, and then later on as as time progresses it becomes more clear as to what the actual Royal Arch is, uh, but can you give us a little bit more insight of what it might have referred to when in that journal it says. Yeah, that, wow. actually, that's a good question, and that would be very hard for me to answer. Uh, if it was a physical object carried in a parade, uh, in the most excellent master degree, we actually do use an arch, uh, and inscribed on the face of the arch is uh, are the words, Holiness to the Lord. Uh, it is an arch in which a keystone is deposited, uh, and it's used in the ceremony uh, where we recreate the dedication of the temple, this being the last, uh, the last act to finish the temple was to place that final keystone in the final arch. Uh, so uh, that might be what they may well have carried that in procession, uh, and uh, uh, that basically uh, illustrating the royal arch. Uh, the actual one referred to in the uh, work, though, would certainly not be one you would see because it would be under the temple and it would be holding up the basically the floor of the Sanctum Sanctorum so uh, uh, that would be sort of hard to uh, carry around in a parade and, and what we use here in Virginia is a two-dimensional uh, arch uh, okay. in Pennsylvania the keystone they use is a three-dimensional keystone which is more realistic uh, although a true keystone would probably have six or eight uh, faces on it, uh, depending on uh, the arch structure underneath, whether it was six arches making the vault or eight arches making the vault. So, uh, uh, hey Don, can you uh, can you talk a little bit about Master's Marks? Because that is one of the the things that I found to be the absolute coolest part of the Royal Arch for me is the idea that you know each operative stonemason gets to sign their work and as a Royal Arch companion you actually get to make your own signature. 
Well, actually, when you when you uh, look at the uh, practices of the uh, uh, operative masons, uh, they would have uh, collected a mark book where each uh, person working on that particular job would have to sign his name and affix his mark to it. And there was a very good reason for that, and that is that they had to mark each stone with their mark. Uh, this was sort of a uh, quality control kind of thing. So if you had a guy that was screwing up, you knew who it was. Uh, but on the <laughs> other hand, the paymaster had to know, okay, I got X number of stones with this mark. Who do I owe how much to? And that, that was the way they actually kept track of, of doing that. So that was a very, very important uh, uh, aspect of the work. Um, not long ago, down at the George Washington National Masonic Memorial, uh, they had a display just outside the South Lodge Room, and in the display were facing stones uh, made of marble uh, for the White House. And the story that goes behind that is just absolutely incredible. And I, I felt so uh, lucky and privileged to actually see these stones. Uh, when Harry Truman was president of the United States, uh, Bess uh, she liked to play the piano, and they had a big piano in the White House, and one day one of the feet of the piano actually fell through the floor. The place was ready to cave in, and so Truman ordered a rebuilding of the White House. Uh, basically, they erected scaffolding to support the outside walls and totally demolished everything on the inside, and uh, they built with concrete block and re steel reinforced concrete. Uh, and so the inside of the White House is not old at all. <laughs> the, the exterior is, but the inside is not. And they totally reconstructed it. Well, Truman, uh, he was Grand Master of Masons in uh, Missouri. And as he was walking through the work site one day, uh, he spied a stone with a mason's mark on it. And he immediately knew what that was. And when he saw that, he ordered that all the intact stones with marks like that be collected and placed on pallets and he then gave them to the District of Columbia the Grand Lodge and that Grand Lodge had orders to uh, uh, give a stone to each of the grand jurisdictions in the US and uh, they actually uh, uh, gave some stones to uh, adjacent juris... oh there's the picture how about that uh, they gave stones to uh, other jurisdictions, and they borrowed these back in order to show them down there. Now, in in one of the uh, 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 cases, they actually had the uh, mark book, and, and the story behind this uh, is that while the White House was being built, uh, there were no Masons in this country available to work on the White House. Uh, every Mason in this country was working on building the Capitol building. Mm. and there there was nobody. So they actually sent over to uh, a lodge in Scotland and had the entire lodge come over and uh, we borrowed from them for this display the lodge mark book and it showed in there the the names and the marks of each of these men and you could actually go look at a stone and and try to memorize the mark and go over at the book and see who it was that made that stone and that was just so incredible to me to see that something. That is awesome. That, yeah, that's that's amazing. Cool. Yeah, that's cool. so that that's basically the reason for the marks. Now, modern times, we make our marks uh, uh, artistically. The believe me, the uh, operative masons. It was a functional utilitarian thing uh, because a chisel is a straight line. Uh, they did not have any curves in their marks. They were all straight line marks. They looked like keys, uh, feathers, arrows, kites. Uh, I mean, uh, they were whatever you could carve quickly uh, and cleanly with the, uh, a straight line. And by the way, the marks were always placed on faces of the stone that would have been mortared, uh, not on faces that would have shown. Uh, okay. Every once yep. in a while you will see marks on it, it. Like if you go over in England on some of the interior walls uh, of some of the uh, cathedrals and such, uh, if you look very high up, you need binoculars to do it, uh, sometimes you can see stones, but they knew those stones were going to be up where nobody would see them, so they could place the uh, mark anywhere they wanted on those stones. But uh, typically, the stones were placed in uh, the marks were placed in uh, inconspicuous places. So. That's that's one of the things that I found uh, about the the mark of of the mason, and it made me think of the fact that they are 
towards the interior uh, made me think that we do work and we don't necessarily externalize and, and show everybody else, look what I did. No, you know, we're just showing ourselves. We know ourselves what we've done instead of boasting, you know, of, of the of the goods that we've done. That was a symbolic way that I that I looked at the fact that most of the mar uh, Master Mason's marks were done on the interior and not on the exterior of the building. Well, if you, if we learn nothing else, Juan, in masonry, uh, we learn that everything is hidden. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that's everything deep, is concealed. It. Everything is concealed. In fact, uh, in, in fact, the exchange of an entered apprentice uh, uh, for uh, recognition is uh, I hail, I conceal. But uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that the word is not hail at all. Uh, it's a modern perversion of the word H-E-L-E, -E, uh, I heal, I conceal, and that means I can heal means conceal. And it's the root from which the word hell, hall, just think of it, hell is a place underground, concealed. A hall is a passageway that's concealed. Hole, hole is in the ground, concealed. So that's awesome. Uh, all of these relate to that. I conceal. I conceal. Uh, that's the exchange that really takes place. It's not I hail. I conceal. It's I heal. I conceal. So can you go back to our uh, Grand Lodge uh, committee on work and make sure that they fix? That? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> We've always done it that way, John. Oh, well, that's <laughs> the official response. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's right. You can't argue. Oh. Bill Johnson. <laughs> He's not watching the show, so I think we're okay. Yeah, yeah that's true. Uh, All right. Uh, Jason, anything of note on social media tonight? Uh, there's not a whole lot. We've had a, a couple uh, good comments from our friend and brother, uh, Scott Sherman, who, uh, who relayed that... Uh, you know, um, in Massachusetts, the candidate is spoken to about the uh, about the Mark and the Mark Mason degree, um, and he has his choose his own by the Royal Arts degree, and that's the same as it is in Virginia, um, right. and they have Mark books in St. Andrews dating back 200 years, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it is. So, and that's that's pretty much it. It was light on social media tonight, but uh, I did want to uh, to go ahead and and show my mark because I I was really really excited. Hey, you want to save that? It. You save that for when we wrap up. Everybody Let's save it for when, when we wrap up. Sure, uh, John. That'll that'll make people stick around to the end. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there we go. <laughs> so be sure not to miss the mark at the end of the show. Oh. <laughs> Prepare to be disappointed. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, we we should go into uh, Masonic news and the MMQOT since we uh, we, yeah, we jump right into it. Uh, that's a good point. Um, we'll, we'll take this time to, to catch up on those things. Um, we'll give Nick a minute to um, catch up, but I did want to go over one thing that uh, Juan shared from Masonic News um, that um, this week a man was shot in the hand outside of a Cleveland Masonic temple. Juan, good catch on that. Uh, good, bad catch on that, that gentleman. Uh, that uh, apparently no one knows exactly what happened. Uh, they, there is uh, no suspect right now, but um, you know, Bad things happen after midnight, and this was at 1 a.m. in the temple's parking lot. So, uh, stay tuned. At least he wasn't trying to light it on fire. Yeah, that's true. It could always be worse. Uh, but, you know. Maybe he was. <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> wow. Uh, this is, uh, you know, hopefully not a bad impression on the fraternity. Anything else you want to add to that, one? Or the police. Yeah, that's true. I, I don't think there's a lot happening in lodges at one in the morning. I mean, at least based on our demographics, there's nothing happening at one o'clock. So I doubt that it was a brother or anybody related. Yep. Um, but as soon as we find any information, if anything uh, comes to the surface, I'll post it on the uh, on our pages mm -hmm. so that brothers can see. All right. Thanks for catching that, Juan. Uh, another thing I wanted to add is the uh, librarian of the Philadelphia Society, Harold Davidson, has passed away. He uh, passed away yesterday. So uh, apparently he was uh, 
loved by many, and so for those who have not had a chance to meet him, including myself, uh, apparently have missed a fine friend and brother. So um, our regards go out to the family. Yeah. And then I guess the last thing I wanted to add was that coming up soon is the Celebrating the Craft. So less than a month, or a little over a month, May 16th. Uh, a month and one day. month and two days. month and two days. Math is, is part of the... Uh, I'm a historian, <laughs> not a mathematician. Let's go go back to your uh, liberal arts and sciences there, Jason. <laughs> Geometry, the noblest of science. <laughs> uh, but anyway, celebrating the craft. Fun fact, I never took geometry, ever. Oh, wow. Man. You missed up. Good thing you joined the Masons. I know. Eu Euclid is crying right now. Uh, crying. <laughs> I'm okay with that. Stay tuned. Um, we'll have some more details to share, links and all that good stuff as that date approaches. Uh, that's all we have from Masonic News. Nick, take us away to the MMQOT. Thank you very much, John. Uh, so I would. Uh, we're going to try and cut this a little bit short in terms of uh, saying the question. Uh, the question from last week and the answer. So suffice it to say, uh, I would like to congratulate Christopher Croto of Dorchester Lodge No. 1, Grand Lodge of Vermont, and Lou Bedford of Palestine Lodge No. 158 of the Grand Lodge of Ohio for answering the correct, uh, the uh, giving us the correct response, which was the oldest surviving Master Mason certificate is commonly called the Depina Certificate. It was issued by the Premium Grand Lodge of England in 1767, and the earliest surviving ancient certificate was called the University. So thank you very much for that, those excellent answers. And so now, let's go into the Masonic Monday question on Tuesday, for the week of April 13th, 2015. Don, no answering. This week's, yeah, <laughs> and, and let me tell you, you'll, you'll know why soon. This, this week's question is, this famous Freemason described the royal arch as the root, heart, and marrow of masonry. Your question, who was this famous Freemason, and in what year was he exalted to the royal arch degree? And bonus, what Grand Lodge position did he hold? And that is a trick question, I'm just warning you now. When you have your answer, send it to Masonic Monday at gmail.com. Don't forget to include your lodge name, lodge number, and the hashtag TMMRMRQQMRQ. <laughs> Those Don't are very it right. <laughs> Got it. Nailed it. <laughs> no, we're sorry, everybody. <laughs> Nick is list <less> Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, so many acronyms. I can't do it. I, I can't do it. So anyway, uh, yeah. So please send in your answers again to Masonic Monday at gmail.com. Okay. With that, Nick, why don't you uh, start taking us home, and do you, do you have your mark? Well, I, I have my mark. I'll draw it in the air, because on your mark? I don't seem to have it on my computer. So anyway, it was a... Um, I'm, you, I'm just a tiny little bit paper? Swedish. <laughs> tiny little bit Swedish. You know, honestly... Ugh. Oh, man. I'm, I know. I'm terrible at, at keeping paper around. I'm I'm a terrible mason, so it's okay. It's okay. I'm just terrible. But uh, you know, honestly, uh, uh, my mark is uh, my initials in runic uh, uh, um, writing. I'm a little bit Swedish, just this much, and a little bit less Norwegian. So I just thought, you know, it'd be kind of cool. It's my initials, and you know, I I don't even I, I'm I'm so bad. I don't even have my my chapter penny on me. So. Ooh. Uh, Ooh. If somebody, yeah, I know. If somebody needs to come to my aid, I'm pretty much done. So, <laughs> <laughs> what else have you got, Nick? Pretty bad. Don't don't feel bad, uh, Nick. But, you I, know, I honestly, probably lost about five chapter pennies already in my uh, <laughs> career as a Royal Arch Mason. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, luckily because that was my high priest project for my first term in that particular chair, I uh, I I made custom ones. And so I've have, I have these custom ones. I bought them from the chapter because I do chapter penny trading with uh, Scottish Masons. So 
you know, I trademark tokens for chapter pennies. And yeah, it's it's one of those that I have them lying all over the place. Of course they're all upstairs. So <laughs> and I know everybody wants to see me, so I, I decided I, I better stay here. So uh, but you know for me I, I really find the Royal Arch degree to be a very a very good set of, of degrees and you know I'm working on this this little quiet project of trying to have it so that lodges and chapters work more closely together and I'm trying it with this particular pet project that I can't talk about it's a secret so don't ask um, but it's a, it's kind of this this idea that you know not necessarily the story that you find in the royal arch versus the story you find in the third degree you know they're not necessarily you know bookends where you're like seen and then next and then the next curtain opens and it's like, oh yeah, of course this needed a sequel, right? But for me, you know, it completes these themes. You know, and particularly we have three tenets in Freemasonry: uh, faith, hope, and charity. And those three tenets, um, at, at the end of the th- at the end of the third degree, you know, there's a there's a different feeling than when you get to the end of the Royal Arch degree. And it, it makes it so that those the themes that you find in the third degree and the themes that you see in the Royal Arch they come together and it it pretty much completes essentially the arch of all masonry. So for me I've always pushed it that you know I I really do believe that all master masons that are within some kind of York Rite system or anything like that, you know, emulation even, that they should complete the Royal Arch so that they can see the end of those themes and to really understand the degree work that they've seen already and to f- not just fill in the gaps, but complete the themes themselves. So, uh, you know, one one last little historical thing I'd like to uh, throw in here is that uh, uh, in the ancient times uh, there were square masons and there were arch masons. Mm-hmm. The square masons erect the walls. The arch masons create the uh, holes in the walls the openings in the walls and it was completely different geometry that they used uh, and they operated completely separately Uh, they obviously had to be working together but they had their own uh, separate teaching their own geometries and the interesting thing is King Edward uh, uh, gave coats of arms to the Masons and the field for the square masons was blue, the field for the arch masons was red. So the idea of the blue lodge and the red uh, goes back into ancient history. Wow! And uh, uh, it's uh, in fact uh, the operatives' rituals even mention that uh, the square masons mark their stones in indelible blue, and the uh, arch masons mark their stones in indelible red. Case closed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Nick, anything else? Oh, sure. I guess I should do... This is plug time, right? Yes. Yup. All right. Well, I have a blog, millennialfreemason.com. Uh, visit there. I've been posting regularly again. So, again, you're welcome, Yay. my readers. Yay. Um, and also, I did a guest stint uh, yesterday on the After Lodge podcast just as, like, a fill-in host just uh, while one of their hosts was... Recuperating, so uh, you know that was kind of fun. So you can go check them out as well. Uh, they sent their regards. Well, Harlan did, and he said thank you guys for being awesome. So just remember, guys, we're awesome. DFTBA. There we go. Uh, and so that's about it. Thanks, Nick. Juan. Um, this was very very exciting. Uh, I really enjoyed the. Have, having uh, Brother Don with us, and I really appreciate the time you've taken to enlighten us all. Uh, I really like your answer for my initial question. It was kind of like uh, uh, I, I was trying to lead in that direction. You know, a lot of brothers are not going to have the option of either pushing for uh, di- different days for degree conferrals. They're going to have to take it as a as a festival knowing what to do and to take it in stride and you know not whine and complain about it but actually learn the the work 
and I intend to to do that with every degree because I really enjoyed my experience. We're not showing the marks here, right? Yeah, you are. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. I'm, I've got mine at the ready. Okay. Here is for those of you who've seen my art. This is my artist signature. I don't know if you can see that. A little higher. A little higher. That's my art artist signature. Mm -hmm. But right underneath, that's mm -hmm. my that's my mark. Nice. I love it. Oh, very good. It, it, it's inspired on my artist signature combined with an alphabet that I created for my children. So in paintings where I write the name of my children, I do it using a special alphabet that is that puppy right there. Very, very cool. And thank you for, for watching and for listening. Make sure that you participate. If there's something that we forgot to cover in this episode... Make sure to put it in the comments notes. Let us know what you what you want to know about whether it's Royal Arch Masonry or if it's a future episode. We love to hear from you. And you can hear more of my personal work at thewindingstairs.com. And I am working on a collection of art that you want. I am working on a collection of art that is about all three degrees in masonry as long as the number three is interspersed throughout the, the work, and it's going to be revealed on a Kickstarter campaign to fund Season 3 of The Winding Stairs. So Ooh. if you want to hear about it, go to thewindingstairs.com and sign up for the email so you can be the first one to know. I like Juan's art like one-day conferrals. Got to catch them all. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Jason? Oh, thanks, John. Um, yeah, last thoughts. You know, Royal Arch is one of the few appendant bodies... Uh, that I've joined so far in my short thus far journey in masonry. And I really, I decided to join the York Rite just because um, I wanted to explore some of the more overtly Christian aspects of masonry, thinking, thinking about, you know, eventually going into the Knights Templar. Uh, but the Royal Arch is just such a, a fantastic set of degrees and... I think, again, one of my favorite parts of, of the Royal Arch degree system is just how it, it's integral to the story of the three degrees that every Mason, wheresoever dispersed, ends up taking. And it's really a, a continuation of the story, and it's really, really neat to being a historian to see that context, because there's a whole lot of context behind the Enter Apprentice, Fellow Craft, and Master Mason degrees, you don't get in the Blue Lodge unless you do a whole lot of digging outside of the ritual. And the Royal Arch really helps to, to fill in those gaps. Um, as far as my, uh, I, I wanted to say Maker's Mark, and it's like, no, that is, <laughs> Me that too. is not it at all. My, uh, my <laughs> That's Mason's <after> the show. <laughs> Mark, yes, my, my Mason's Mark, um, since you know, I'm, I'm a historian, but uh, I'm also a musician. Nice. And so, as if it were a chisel, but uh, this is an eighth note, and it uh, it pays homage to my my love for music um, as one of the seven liberal arts and sciences. Very nice. Uh, and uh, I'm a uh, I'm a regular contributor to the Midnight Freemasons blog, and I've got my own blog, the Two Foot Ruler Masonry in Plain Language. So go check that out. I update it from time to time, and also I just wanted to uh, to share a, a screenshot with everybody. Um, this is actually uh, this is the um, the artwork for this particular episode. This is actually most excellent Don McAndrews pin for for this year. Um, God is our guide, the the nine pointed star, and it's, uh, it's actually three triangles, which is three times three. Yes. Oh. Yeah, so I wanted to make sure that, that everybody actually knew what that artwork was um, as paying homage to our, to our special guest tonight. So that's all from me, John. Excellent. <clears throat> Thank you, Jason. Don, any uh, final thoughts and conclusions you want to wrap up the show with? Well, uh, Jason just mentioned music as being one of the seven liberal arts and sciences. Uh, if you go and ask any uh, music major that has studied musical notation... Uh, and ask them who invented the musical notation that we use today. Who, who is it that discovered the octave? 
Was the it Pythagoras? Pythagoras, absolutely. Because the idea of a th chord which is a third or a fourth or even a fifth is geometric. It has to do with the relation of a length of a vibrating chord. Uh, so there you go. Pythagoras did some experiments and came up with the musical notation system that we use to this day. Very, very cool. Yeah. All right. Well, I do appreciate you coming on and enlightening us to all the fun stuff that is Royal Arch Masonry. So, again, thank you very much. Most excellent. It was a pleasure. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and with that, uh, you know, I did kind of uh, screen share this earlier on when you were describing the degrees. But, you know, <laughs> just... I don't know, this tickled me. That most excellent. Uh, the first thing I think of is uh, it's Bill and Ted. I don't know why, but uh, that is, i got to say, out of all the titles in Masonry, most excellent is, is pretty rad. That's actually Robert Johnson's contribution to the show. Most excellent. He, he pulled that graphic up a couple days ago. Nice. <laughs> Wild Stallion's rule. All right. Uh, as for my mark, <clears throat> I wanted to share that uh, as an engineer, I... Like the concept of architecture as well as network and unity, so I used a simplistic. I did stick with the flat chisel design, uh, but wanted to show an interconnectivity between di different segments. So that's the genesis and story of my mark. <clears throat> so find that where all great artwork is sold. And then, uh, <laughs> in conclusion, um, you know, I think that uh, the Royal Arch degree system is fantastic. Uh, it, it definitely complements the uh, the York Rite degrees, as we talked about earlier, and uh, it definitely adds something to that journey. Um, that's really all I got for now that hasn't been already said, so with that, thanks for watching, and keep searching for more light. Have a good night.